Good afternoon. Um, I'm Eric Sandine. I'm director of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, and I welcome you to this afternoon's event, which is historic for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, because this is the largest assemblage for any of our distinguished speakers that I can remember. a positive spin on saying that I'm, I apologize for, for having such a small room for such an august audience. <laughs> uh, the real reason why this is such an historic event is that since the 31st of March, we now have a base budget for next year and for the years beyond for the, Amer for the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. So after three years of, of uh, living with uh, end of the year uh, budgets that would disappear at the end of the year, we can now actually plan for things in the future. Uh, tonight I thought I'd give you just a short uh, narration of how we got to where we are and at our next event, uh, our next major, our last major event, which is Scott Henkel's uh, lecture on uh, the humanities at the land grant university, flyers for which I have down here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we might have in the future in store for us. Uh, but for just a couple of minutes, I'd like to uh, uh, sort of put our past on record um, and say that um, this is an advertisement for academic planning, actually. Uh, the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research actually came during the anticipated reign of academic plan number three, which uh, came into effect in 2008. Uh, what that did was kick into gear a process that resulted in a faculty group getting together during the 2012-2013 academic year and all of us together, about 27 faculty members in the humanities, planned for this research institute. Uh, we submitted this to Tom Buchanan during the last months of his presidency, and we've been scrambling ever since. Uh, and I just want to give you a sense of how persistent and how vibrant this community is because despite all of the vicissitudes that I don't have to rehearse for you who have, who have been here more than three years, um, this institute has, I think, a pretty good track record. Uh, that is to say, over the last three years, we have supported 23 individual or group projects for, for faculty and professional staff in a dozen different departments and programs, as well as the UW Art Museum, UW Casper, uh, and the Wyoming Humanities Council. Uh, this year, for example, we have seven, we've had seven research presentations by faculty from religious studies, American studies, communication and journalism, modern languages, and English. Um, we've had nine total distinguished speakers, four of them this year, oddly enough, in the year of our most uh, dire financial circumstances, and Lawrence Wessler is the last of the four. Um, and a great event it is. We've supported six summer fellowship winners uh, who have done their own research over the summer months. Uh, we have seven research and, and reading groups. Um, and at, during this academic year, we will have sponsored five special events co-sponsored by the Humanities Council, the Haub School, American Studies, the Honors Program, and two that have so many sponsors that I, I can't name them all. <laughs> uh, they're great collaborative ventures. We've had two international fellows. Um, and all of this has been done by a kind of um, a volunteer executive committee consisting of five wonderful colleagues, um, a core faculty of about 60, uh, and uh, an entire faculty in the humanities of about 120. So this is a real going concern now, and I think we have great things to look forward to in the future. We also have an external board that will be meeting on the 6th of May. So the infrastructure is there. We need to meet as a faculty and decide 
where we want to go in the future. And I think one of the things that, that Lawrence Weschler uh, impressed upon us at lunch, and something that we can actually do now, what we've done so far is bread and butter stuff keeping our community together and sort of promoting faculty research and making connections out into the state. Uh, but Mr. Weschler points out that a lot of what we do in one form or another is play. We play with ideas. We put different kinds of people together just to see what will happen when, when two really interesting minds coalesce or collide or, or whatever. So now we have a chance actually to sit back relax a little bit and think about the play of the, of the intellectual exercise that we're all involved in. Now I'm going to turn um, this handy dandy portable microphone thing over to Issa Helfgott from the History Department who is going to introduce our speaker. So I have two happy tasks um, here for you. The first is just to welcome you and I was starting to say that it's nice to see so many people who I haven't seen here before so thank you for coming. Um, thank you especially to the many programs who are helping to co-sponsor Lawrence Weschler's visit here today. We have the College of Law, the Department of Zoology and Physiology, the Department of Art and Art History, and the Honors Program, as well as the Humanities Institute. And I'm very excited about um, the multiple disciplines who came together to sponsor this talk today. So thank you to everybody involved in those programs. Lawrence Weschler is our distinguished speaker today. He is coming to us after, um, on the heels of many, many accomplishments. Uh, he was a longtime New Yorker for over, New Yorker writer for over 20 years. And his list of publications is distinguished not only in the variety of things that he has written about and the many prizes that he has won, including the National Book Critics Circle Award, and uh, one of his books was nominated for the Pulitzer, and um, he's a two-time recipient of the Lannan Literary Award. Um, but I will say, if you're familiar with any of his works, what really strikes me as the way they stick with you. So his book, Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonders, which is about the Museum of Jurassic Technology in California, is maybe one of my favorite books of all time. So it's really a tremendous pleasure to have uh, the opportunity to welcome here, him here today. So without further ado, Ren. Perhaps a good way to start is with one of the great Lepidopterists of all time. Does anybody know what a lepidopterist is? Butterflies. 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 And, and indeed, this is, this is considered to be one of the great Russian lepidopterists. He was a part-time writer named Vladimir Nabokov. <laughs> Always a good place to begin. Uh, and Nabokov once said, and this is an amazing thing to think about when you listen to what he said. He said, the true master has to combine the imagination of a scientist and the precision of a poet. The imagination of a scientist and the precision of a poet. Um, Frank Kermode was once writing actually about Oliver Sacks and, and he was talking about how, how what a good writer he was and he said poets could learn from him for as Ezra Pound liked to say poetry should be at least as well written as prose. And Pound advised writers to accept the discipline imposed by the great uh, scientist Agassi uh, on his scientific protégés, who had to describe a dead fish over and over till they had it right, while the fish all the while was decomposing. <laughs> or coming full circle, as Cezanne famously said, you have to hurry if you're going to see. Everything is fast disappearing. Speaking of poets, I, I usually like to start these sorts of things with, with what I will call an afternoon or an evening prayer. Everybody goes, oh no, oh no, but calm down. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in this case, uh, the prayer will be from the great Thomas Lynch, our great undertaker poet, former poet laureate of the country, from his newest book, Walking Papers, a poem which is entitled Euclid, you know, the, the geometer, Euclid. What sort of morning was Euclid having when he first considered parallel lines? Or that business about how things equal to the same thing are equal to each other? Who's to know what the day has in it? 
This morning, Bert took it into his mind to make a longbow out of Osage Orange and went on eBay to find the cow bones from which to fashion the tips of the thing. You better have something to pass the time, he says, stirring his coffee, smiling. And Murray is carving a model truck from a block of walnut he found downstairs, whittling away. He thinks of the years he drove between Detroit and Buffalo delivering parts for General Motors. Might he have nursed theorems on lines and dots or the properties of triangles? Oh, by the way, I should show you here. Oh, I'm sorry. Right there. Might he have nursed theorems on lines and dots or the properties of triangles or the congruence of adjacent angles? Or clearing customs at Niagara Falls arrived at some insight on holes and parts or, ac or an axiom involving radii and the making of circles, how distance from a center point can be both increased endlessly and endlessly split, a mystery whereby the local and the global share the same vexations and geometry. Possibly this is where God comes into it, who breathed the common notion of coincidence into the brain of that Alexandrian, Euclid, over breakfast three, 23 centuries ago, who glimpsed for a moment that morning the sense it all made. Life, killing time, the elements, the dots and lines and angles of connection, an egg's shell opened with a spoon, the sun's connivance with the moon's decline, Sophia, the maidservant, pouring juice, everything, everything coinciding the arc of memory, her fine parabolas, the bend of a bow, the curve of the earth, the turn in the road. Sophie, the maidservant, as in Sophia, the Hellenistic Alexandrine personification of wisdom. Although I myself like to think that he obviously was thinking of Vermeer's milkmaid, who's not pouring uh, uh, juice, but pouring milk. An amazing painting, by the way. You can't, I mean, this is obviously no way to look at things, but when you actually see, the thing that's amazing about Vermeer over and over again is that he's the invention of cinema. He, he, he's the inventor of cinema. He figures out a way to paint people who are still, who have to remain still, so that you have duration. You can see her there holding, and you can almost see the, 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 the ropiness of the milk as it comes down. Um, he does that over and over again. Anyway, Vermeer, in turn, brings me to another great poet, Wisława Zimborska, uh, the great Polish Nobel Prize winning poet, uh, S-Z-Y-M-B-O-R-S-K-A. Uh, <laughs> I used to be on the Rolodex for NPR when, when something happened in Poland. And, and uh, the day that Jimborska got the Nobel Prize, they had me on and I said, you know how, how, uh, how they're always giving Nobel Prizes to people you've never heard of? And then Susan Sontag comes on and she turns out to have been re reading them for 30 years and you're go you feel like a complete idiot. And, and, and then you go read them and actually you can't stand them anyway. And, and <laughs> this will not be like that. You will read Jimborska and she will become your favorite poet. Uh, and by the way, it's very easy to find Jimborska at the bookstore at the library. It's S-Z-Y, it's the last of the S's. <laughs> um, and she has a poem called Maybe All This, by which she means all this. Maybe all this is happening in some lab. Under one lamp by day and billions by night. Maybe we're experimental generations, poured from one vial to the next, shaken in test tubes, not scrutinized by eyes alone, each of us separately plucked up by tweezers in the end. Or maybe it's more like this, no interference. The changes occur on their own according to plan, the graph's needle slowly etches its predictable zigzags. Maybe thus far we haven't been of much interest. The control monitors aren't usually plugged in only for wars, preferably large ones, or for the odd ascent above our clump of earth, or for major migrations from point A to point B. Maybe just the opposite. They've got a taste for trivia up there. Look on the big screen, a little girl is sewing a button on her sleeve. The radar shrieks, 
The staff comes at a run. What a darling little bean with its tiny heart beating inside it. How sweet its solemn threading of the needle. Someone cries enraptured. Quick, get the boss. Tell him he's got to see this for himself. <laughs> for surely the image Zimborska must have had in mind, the image of the girl spread up there across the big screen, must have been very like Vermeer's lace maker. In my dreams, she wrote elsewhere, I paint like Vermeer of Delft. And one of the most remarkable things about that painting, in turn, is the way that everything in it, even in the painting itself, and definitely in this projection, is slightly out of focus. Either too close or too, for, too far. Except the one thing that is completely in focus is the little V. You can barely see it in this projection. The little V of the threads coming down, uh, the V of concentration. Indeed, the painting is all about concentration. Gradually, inspiringly, we come to concentrate on the very thing the girl herself is concentrating on, everything else receding to the periphery of our awareness. Like el nothing else so much as a painter, or in this context we might say a scientist, lavishing his or her ent entire attention on a subject. Or else, perhaps, what happens when, as we ourselves pause, dumbstruck, before this canvas in the midst of our museum walk. Are we perhaps exaggerating here? Look more closely at the threads themselves. They range themselves, as I say, into that crisp, tight V couched in the M-like cast of light playing upon the hands. So you have V and then you have M, right? Um, the girl, godlike, momentarily focuses all her attention upon V.M., Vermeer, uh, the very author of her existence. And hence, back to the poem, for the girl threading her needle, the little darling bean with its tiny heart beating inside it, is of course nobody else but the poet herself, intent over her scribbled page, laboring for that perfected line, or else subsequently perhaps her readers, hunched over her completed poem. Though as the creator of the poem, Zimborski is of course also simultaneously the boss. As we too, the readers, get momentarily to be recreating, recapitulating her epiphanic insight, seeing it clearly for ourselves. Indeed, Zimborski gets it just right. How in the perfected work of art, be it a poem or a painting, or I would argue an experiment and its conclusion, across that endlessly extended split second of concentrated attention, artists and audience alike partake of a doubled awareness, the expansive vantage lucidly equipoised of God, the concentrated experience meltingly empathic of his most humble subject. So I want to begin by talking about concentration. The moment, as the great art critic Leo Steinberg said, when the artist stop ask, stops asking, what can I do, and starts asking, what can art do? Uh, I suspect there's something uh, very similar to that with scientists. What is the world doing? Or with Diderot, uh, the great uh, French Enlightenment encyclopedist, who noted how painting is best when the edit artist steps back, slack-jawed, before his creation. Diderot, who also said that the artist is merely the first observer of the completed work, which is to say that moment when he stops being the creator and suddenly becomes the slack-jawed witness, the first witness. For, of course, the whole distinction between artists and scientists is incredibly arbitrary. About 15 years ago, I was invited to become the head of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU, which I agreed to do on one condition, that the sciences would be included as part of the humanities. You know, this endless debate about the humanities versus the sciences and so forth, it's the stupidest debate of all time. <laughs> the sciences are one of the humanities and need to be thought of that way. And uh, 
Uh, we used to, uh, I used to, when I was at the, fest, uh, at the institute, have all kinds of events, and we would have things called wonder cabinets, where we would just have one cool thing after another all day long. And one of the people we would regularly bring was Tom Eisner, the great entomologist from Cornell. Whenever you would see something in the New York Times about, about some, in the Science Times, about some crazy uh, bug thing, it was always coming out of his lab. Uh, anyway, and, and, and the people who really loved going to hear Tom Eisner were the scientists who are stuck in their incredibly narrow silos, you know, working on this one little kink in the genome of some worm or something, you know. And for them, getting to hear about an entire cockroach, <laughs> it was like the humanities. I mean, it was like, you know, really exciting. The thing to say, though, is that this distinction between the arts and the science is, is very, very recent. Uh, not that long ago, in the age of wonder, the 16th and 17th century, um, aristocrats would vie with one another gathering together wonder cabinets, such as this one here, more or less following Francis Bacon's prescription for the essential apparatus of a complete, P-L-E-A-T, complete learned gentleman. And they were all men. This is from 1594 when Bacon said that such a gentleman should attempt to, quote, achieve within a small compass a model of the universal made private. Any such would-be magus would certainly want to compile, in Bacon's words, a goodly huge cabinet, and cabinet could also mean room. You know, a camera, you know it was not just a, a cabinet, it was so forth. But we're in Whatsoever the hand of man by exquisite art or engine hath made rare in stuff, form, or motion, whatsoever singularity, chance, and the shuffle of things hath produced, whatsoever nature hath wrought in things that want life, don't have life, and may be kept, shall be sorted and included. And you'll notice how in this particular wonder cabinet, you see all kinds of crazy things. You see shells, you see beetles, you see paintings, you see micro miniature sculptures, that, that round thing there, you could look inside of it, and inside of it was another globe that was sculpted, and inside of that there was a hole that you could look inside of another gold globe that was sculpted. And then you would have the um, a true wonder would be the lens that was used when that was made, you know, and all this stuff was thrown together. Um, you know, when you go to see a, a Durer painting nowadays at a museum, and it's just hanging there in the art museum, you know, you have to understand that every Durer painting you ever see was originally shown alongside of shells and beetles and bugs and spider webs and all kinds of weird things, which were all these great, marvelous wonders. It was the wonder of an artist's skill, the wonder of a scientist's intuition. All this was one, and it only happens much, much later in the 19th, and really the 20th century, where you begin to have museums of technology, museums of natural history, museums of art. This all gets broken up. Until, the, uh, until late into the 19th century, there wasn't even a word scientist. People were known as natural philosophers. That's what, what you did in those days. Um, one could likewise cite the examples of, say, Leonardo or Michelangelo, uh, who would never have understood the distinction between art and science. If you, asked, if you asked Michelangelo what he was doing when he was doing anatomy drawings, are you doing science, are you doing, uh, he was, he was, uh, it, it, one of the, he would say he was celebrating human being, human being being the reflection of God's being, because men were made in God's image. He would, he would, uh, you know, he had all sorts of things he would say like that, but he would, and the same with Leonardo. They would never have made a distinction. This is one kind of thing I'm doing, this is the other kind. Uh, and in this context, perhaps the most interesting uh, case to look at, and we'll stop for a moment and look at it so much more carefully, is Rembrandt's famous painting, The Anatomy Lesson. I just want to stop here and look for a second. Uh, the year is 1632, and this is The Anatomy Lesson of Prof Professor Tulp uh, by Rembrandt, although it's not this Rembrandt, it's this Rembrandt. He is 26 years old when he paints this painting. And he's just arrived in Amsterdam. Um, we know uh, the name of the professor. We know there's a cadaver who was incidentally a recently executed thief. Uh, we even know his name, but that's another lecture. 
Uh, and the thief, as you can see, has one of his arms play, played open and an anatomical lesson is taking place. Uh, we see, uh, count them, six onlookers. I'm not going to include that guy on the far left uh, who obviously came late. <laughs> and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that if you just block him out, that's the painting ends there, obviously. But, but, he, but he came in with his subscription late. Th these were all paid for by the people who were going to be in it. And he said, but I want to be in it. I want to be in it. And so Rembrandt kept him there as the doofus he always will be through all eternity. <laughs> the man who was late. But leave him out. What you really can't see here, and it's too bad, uh, is, uh, and when you go, go home and look at it on online, but there's a kind of light that envelops the other six and the, prof uh, and the professor and the corpse, and it is a light that when you look at it and you step back, you realize that the whole thing is a skull. That the professor and this guy here are like eyes, this guy is an ear. Uh, this is, it, it, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's very, it's very, uh, you can't see it here. But anyway, uh, it recalls an event, the day, uh, and everyone uh, who, in those days, and this is, by the way, very important when you go to a museum and you see paintings like this, you shouldn't think of them as snapshots. There weren't cameras, chemical photography in those days. Anybody who saw this would know how it was made, that the artist had attended the, the actual event, but then had called in the people one at a time to be portrayed, that he, would, that, that he was very thoughtful about how he portrayed them. There was a whole kind of, you know, so that the whole thing is like a novel. It's a work of fiction. It is a fictive recreation, as it were, of, of this thing that had happened. Um, so there's some things that are in particularly interesting about this. Um, the first, of course, is that it clearly alludes to a whole tradition of Christ uh, after he is brought down from the uh, from the cross, and he is laid out, uh, in this case, Montaigne. Um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and it's also the case, keep in mind, that Christ also was, uh, was crucified beside thieves, two thieves. In this case, by the way, the thief, let's just go back for a second. Uh, we know his name, as I say, and we know what he was uh, executed for. He was arrested executed for, a rep for stealing a cape off of a nobleman. A cape just like the cape surrounding uh, the, the anatomist, Dr. Tulp. Um, a weird thing, though, is if you notice it has that flayed arm. That is not how, there's a whole tradition of, of paintings of anatomical theaters. Uh, this is another one, and this is how it was actually done. They would always, it was usually done in winter. Uh, and almost always you would start with the belly because that's the part that's going to decompose the fastest. So you, you want to get that out and, and out of the way. Uh, in this case, though, it has the hand first. And that is, it seems to me, clearly a reference to this frontispiece to the great, great anatomy book of that time. It's from years earlier by Vesalius. And the, the uh, person who did the, the images in the Vesalius anatomy book was a, a great artist named von Kalker, um, Jan Stefan von Kalker, C-A-L-C-A-R, uh, who had been a student of Titian's. And so at some level, uh, uh, this was uh, done in 1543, so it's almost 100 years earlier. At some level, Rembrandt is either boasting, I am the heir to that great tradition by starting with the arm, or uh, probably even more likely, Tulp has assigned him to do it this way so that he will be recognized as the Vesalius of his time. Um, in any case, uh, uh, you end up with this, Im this image here. Um, but I want to focus on something else for a moment. And for that, I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. And I can see you if you're not closing your eyes. You've all, you're not closing your eyes. Uh, and you've all seen this, you're not closing your eyes. You've all seen this, this image a hundred times. You know that there's a group in the middle that are kind of focused on something, dumbstruck as they're looking at it. Uh, what are they looking at, this group in the middle? They're, they're, they are absolutely astonished at something. 
And in your memory, if you're like me, I think you think that they're looking at the flayed hand, like you know, there's something they've never seen before in their lives, which they probably haven't. Now, now open your eyes, and you'll see that in fact, and I'm talking about that little triangle, those three guys there. We'll talk about the other three guys in a second. Those three guys are completely dumbfounded looking at the professor's hand. The prof By the way, there are all kinds of books that say that what they're looking at is this book over here, and they're in, that they're breathing in the tradition of knowledge, blah, blah, blah. That is such a thing that people who write books about art would say. They are not looking at that. They are obviously not looking at that. They are looking at this. And the professor is saying, with these muscles here, you can do this. And they're looking at it like they've never seen anything like it before in their lives. Which is to say that this is a painting, first of all, it's not about death, it's about life. And specifically about looking, about vision, and about the hand, manipulability. Which is to say, let's look close, more closely here. By the way, something that's really interesting, when you go to see this painting, and it happens to be right next door to the Vermeers in the Moritzus, so you go to see it. And what's really funny, again, we have a movie, is this guy right over here, whose beard, by the way, makes him look exactly like this guy here. But he has one eye looking at the professor's hand and one eye looking at the flayed arm, as if he's going. You can almost see it there, and it's so dark you can't really see it. Let's see if we get closer. Do you see how one, arm, one eye is there and the other eye is looking down? Uh, and again, it's, it's trying to create that sense of movement. But so what, if you're talking about a painting that's about vision and the hand, you're basically talking about the miracle of painting. Or rather, it's as if, <laughs> this is partly what the painting is about. It's this incredible, you, you, you are invited to think that at some point, Vermeer himself, actually Rembrandt himself, was painting the hand of the professor that they were all looking at so dumbfounded. Um, so that's what the guys in the middle are looking at. What are the guys, three guys, for, again, forget Dumkoff over here. The, <laughs> these three guys are all looking out, right? And so they are looking at us. In fact, we know that this was an anatomical theater that looked very much like this room here, actually. And uh, this was done in Leiden all the time, but only once a year in, in, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, again, Vermeer had just uh, arrived, in, uh, excuse me, Rembrandt had just arrived in Amsterdam. And uh, so we know, we even know the date uh, that it was taking place on. Um, um, Excuse me, one thing, one thing I wanted to say about the, I'm sorry, uh, about looking and the gobsmackedness of seeing. Uh, because it seems to me this is also uh, a way in which artists and scientists dovetail on top of each other. What does the scientist say when he finally figured something out? Oh, I see. I see. I get it. Uh, the veils, we say, fall from his eyes. They are vouched a fresh perspective. What scientists are striving after is what artists are doing all the time. David Bohm, the physicist, says that physics is a form of insight and hence a form of art. Einstein always claimed that imagination was more important than knowledge. Leonard Schlein has written an entire book on art and physics in which he charts how time and again the artists were out front of the scientists. For example, Giotto was working on conic sections and ellipses long before Kepler. Or the ways in which Manet and Monet and Cezanne were playing with compressions of time and space, the plasticity of time and space, before Einstein. Now having said that, I want to come back and now talk about the those guys looking at what they are looking out at. The date was January 16th, uh, 1632. Um, there was a bunch of people in the room. Rembrandt was one of the people in the room, so in a sense, they, this is Rembrandt's eyes view. Uh, they are looking at Rembrandt, taking it in. They are also looking at us as the audience, uh, so that in another way, sense, this is, was the actual situation in a certain sense. Um, but Sebald, 
the great uh, German writer W.G. Sebald is among people who have noticed something very interesting about January 16th, 1632, because without doubt, one of the people in the audience would have been this man here. Can any of you identify him? This is Descartes. Descartes, who had a passion about anatomy, who was in exile, had only arrived two years earlier in Amsterdam, would without doubt have attended this, um, and uh, who, uh, within five years, in 1637, would be publishing his, dis uh, his uh, uh, discourse on method and geometry, uh, and the meditations on first philosophy coming a few years after that in 1641. And I mention that because Descartes, you are looking, as it turns out, at the moment that art and science delaminate from each other. When you look at this, that is what actually is happening because somebody in the audience there is going to, within a few years, be coming up with the analytic geometry, which, by the way, had to happen in Europe, or at least where Christendom was happening because it's, a, it's basically taking the cross and expanding it in every direction. Uh, but you are also beginning to get the, the split between uh, body, the mind-body split starts with Descartes in a very important way. Uh, he, he has all these passages in the meditation, that how do I know that people are real? How do I know that they're not automatons? They're not, they have all these flexes that when these little things are moved, their hands move up and down, I can't tell that there's anybody there. Uh, all that kind of stuff that will be, which will make it possible to do all sorts of science as you go forward are happening in the mind of somebody in the audience at that moment. So it's a rather amazing uh, thing. I mentioned uh, Descartes and the analytic geometry. It takes me back to one of my favorite philosophers, and I will take out to dinner anybody who can identify this person. What? No, a very good guess, but it's not Aquinas. Very good guess, but it's not William of Ockham. Ah, my money, my money. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> it's Nicholas of Cusa. And if you've never heard of Nicholas of Cusa, he is like one of the really, really, really cool people. He was a uh, bishop of Cologne. He uh, was a uh, astronomer. Long before Kepler and Copernicus, he had figured out that the Earth goes around the sun. Um, he he was also a number mystic. And indeed, he was in an argument, so we're in the 1400s here. He was in basically in an argument with Aquinas. And if we want to describe Aquinas as a Neo-Aristotelian, he was a Neoplatonist. And in a certain sense, what Aquinas is doing, and this is extremely simplified, but Aquinas is saying, you know, if you want to get knowledge of God, you have to really look at his, uh, the creator. You have to look at all his creations. So you have to do an entire book of fishes, and you do an entire book of ethics, and you do an entire book of aesthetics, and you do, uh, you do books on everything, uh, and that will get you closer and closer to the creator because you will have surveyed all of creation. Uh, and uh, our friend Nicholas Accusa, who writes a wonderful book called Learned Ignorance, uh, he, he says, that can't be right. I mean, take a, hold on, uh, trigger warning, we have half a sentence of mathematics coming up. <laughs> he says, take a circle, and inside the circle put a, an n-sided regular polygon. n could be three, in which case it's a regular triangle, now it becomes a square, now it becomes a pentagon. And he says, you'd think the more sides you add, the closer you would be getting to the, to the circle. That when you had a million-sided regular polygon, you'd be damn close to the circle. And he said, of course, but you're getting farther and farther away. You're, 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 I'm being told that my thing is falling. Oh, dear, look at that. I've driven my man crazy. Isn't that funny? You're getting farther and farther away. My microphone was down here. <laughs> You, you, you would th you're getting farther far away. I mean, a circle, a, a million-sided polygon has a million sides, has a million angles. A circle has one line and no angles, you know. And he said that at some point, you have to make the leap, he coined the phrase, the leap of faith, from the cord to the arc. 
Kierkegaard got that phrase from him. And that that is as difficult to do and no easier to do when you're doing it from the triangle as from when you're doing it from the million-sided thing. And it can only be accomplished in grace. This is a really useful metaphor in all kinds of ways. If you're a writer, you know you take the, the million things you're going to try and put in your piece and you put them all in a pile and you're trying to work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work and then suddenly it works and you have no idea why it worked. When I covered solidarity in Poland um, uh, and you went to the people in, in September 1980 and said, you know, you've been trying for 40 years to do this. Why didn't, why didn't it happen right now? And they said, beats us. You try and you try and you try to do something that then happens by itself. It would not have happened without all that trying, without, which is preparation, but when it happens, the trying is not what caused it to happen. And I think scientists have this same experience. They go through all the different experiments and so forth, but, but then it clicks. And by the way, the way, thing he says is you know you've hit the truth because you tap it and it rings true. Um, what's also fun about Cusa, of course, is that he, that he is with all of that a half inch away from the calculus, which will be the next big thing uh, after Descartes. You're going to eventually get to Newton and Leibniz both discovering the calculus simultaneously. Okay, with all that by way of, of preface, or that the preface in this lecture is longer than the core of the lecture, <laughs> so don't worry. I want to get to some artists, and two in particular. Uh, who I've had the good fortune to spend a lot of time with. Um, Robert Irwin and David Hockney, a few years ago, uh, I published a book that was uh, 30 years of my conversations with Irwin and 25 years of my conversations with Hockney. Um, and uh, they're very, very different, uh, and yet uh, in many ways very similar. They're both omnivorously curious, uh, self-taught, and open, among other things, as we'll see, to talking to scientists and savoring that. Starting with Irwin. Um, if you'd asked him back in 1968, about uh, a decade into his artistic career, if he thought there was any relationship between what he did and what scientists did, he would have said, absolutely not, completely different. He would have had contempt for scientists as they would have had contempt for him and so forth. Around uh, 1970, he began working as part of the Art and Technology which, uh, show at, at LACMA, which was a very seminal attempt, one of the first of these. He was paired with a guy named Edward Wirtz at Garrett Aerospace in Technology. He was a, a, a psychologist and a, uh, he was a designer of spacecraft to make them habitable and so forth. And Wirtz was, was one of those guys with a short sleeve white shirt and a plastic uh, and, and crew cut, and Irwin was a hippie, long hair, and so forth. Within one year, Wirtz had quit Garrett Aerospace and become a Jungian psychoanalyst, <laughs> and, Wirt, and, and uh, Irwin had cut his hair and had a crew cut, and uh, so it was quite an amazing thing to watch. But Irwin began to think about, they would talk a lot about the difference about how they went about things, and, and uh, Irwin said, for example, at one point, Take a chemist, for example, I'm not quoting Irwin. He's talking to me about five years after that, 1975. He starts out with a hypothesis about what might happen if he created, uh, what might be created if he combined a few chemicals and he begins simply by doing trial and error. Two thirds of this, one third of that, and he marks down the result. He tries one third of this and one third of th that and one third of something else. And then he tries one quarter and three quarters, and he proceeds on that basis in a sort of yes, no trial and error. What the artist does is essentially the same. In other words, what you do when you start to do a painting is that you begin with a basic idea, a hypothesis, if you will. Uh, you're going to do a figurative painting or a non-figurative or whatever. So you're going to paint a figurative painting about that model over there and the trees outside beyond her and the oranges on the table. It's just a million yes, no decisions. You try something in the painting, you look at it, and you say, uh, no. You sort of erase it out, you move it around, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, the, uh, you go through a million ways, it's exactly the same thing. The only difference is the character of the product. 
let's say at a particular point the scientist gets what he has set out to get. He arrives at what he projected would happen if he mixed this particular combination of chemicals in the right way. But the same thing happened, the same thing is true of the artist when he finally gets the right combination. He stops. He knows he's finished. For Erwin, however, if art is in many ways like science, it's at the same time not science. And the ways in which it's not are also very important. Once the scientist is finished, he went on, you can look back over his notes to consider the precise sequence of yes-no weighings that brought uh, him to that solution. It's all quite logical and structured. The artist, on the other hand, keeps no such record, although his drawings would love it if he did. Rather, he literally paints over his mistakes. <coughs> Six months later, when you ask him, why'd you stop there? He'll say, well, because it felt right. And his answer may not seem acceptable from a logical point of view. I mean, it seems as if he just chanced upon a final version. But in fact, it's quite reasonable. Given the basic fundamental, he's tried just about every damn combination possible, every way possible, until he's finally arrived at what makes sense to him. The critical difference is that the artist measures from his intuition, his feeling. In other words, he, he uses himself as the measure whereas the scientist measures out of an external logic uh, and makes his decision finally on whether it fits the process in terms of various external abstract measures. Elsewhere, he's talked about, he talks about the difference between logic and reason. And for a long time, I thought these were synonyms, and he meant them as antonyms. And if you want to summarize the difference, you, you, you use logic, but you reason. You don't use reason. Reason is you using yourself, your sense of, you take a feel of the situation and you reason about it. Logic, another major difference is that uh, scientists break things down. They precisely don't look at the whole thing. They, they take a little section of reality and then they use all kinds of logical things on it. Artists, by contrast, go wide. Scientists are looking for consistencies. Artists savor inconsistencies. These are all, you know, but they do it in similar sorts of ways. And, and uh, uh, as, as summing up, uh, Erwin said, and reasoning appears to be more confused, more haphazard, partly because of the scale of what it tries to deal with. The logical, in a sense, seems more successful because it cuts the scale down. In fact, that's what makes it logical. It takes a very concise cut of the world. We're back to Descartes here. And simply defines or refines by deduction the properties of that cut. But it never deals with the overall complexities of the situation. It only applies within the confines in which it operates. So it seems much clearer. In this context, I'm reminded of Jaron Lanier, the great computer uh, scientist and master of virtual reality and all kinds of amazing things, who recently wrote about the way that, quote, listen to this, information systems need to have information in order to run. But information underrepresents reality. What makes something fully real is that it is impossible to fully represent it to completion. Isn't that a great notion? In a way, we're back to Nicholas of Cusa. The best information you can get is a billion-sided polygon, but you're not going to get all the way out. Um, uh, Eudora Welty as this, the great short story writer says, making reality real is the artist's responsibility. Kant says somewhere that a work of art is a specific instance of a general law that cannot be stated. Uh, the, how, the artist, however, and now I'm back with Erwin, quote, uh, as a reasoning being attempts to deal with the overall complexity of which all the logical subsystems are merely se segments. He deals with them through the intuitive side of his human potential, and here inconsistency are as meaningful as consistencies. Um, now, uh, and by the way, one of the things he s talks about, which is quite fascinating, is he says that this division began to happen, he, he even goes back 500 years ago, but certainly with Descartes, let's say. And, but that the civilization which you and I live in makes most of its critical decisions based on logic. I feel, though, that maybe 150 years ago, which is a legacy we're now having to deal with, art began to drop out of that. It began to become less logical. Even though it proceeded logically, it found questions that could not be answered logically. 
and here we're starting with impressions in, in a way, well, well, we'll get to that in a second. Now I want to go over to Hockney for a few seconds. After uh, the f I published the original edition of my book about Irwin uh, back in 1982, and it ran in The New Yorker, I got a call from Hockney, whom I'd never met before, and he said he'd been reading this book, uh, and it was dri driving him crazy. He disagreed with every single thing in it, but he couldn't stop reading it, and did I want to come over and visit with him? Um, uh, what was so interesting again to me was how similar they were. For both of them, uh, they both said in different, at different times and emphatically that the great moment of the 20th century is cubism. And that if you think cubism is just painting, you don't get it. That in 1907, 08, 09, up through 1914, the people who were doing that were trying, and it gets combined with all sorts of other things, were trying to break through uh, uh, and, and that they, the great thing in cubism, if we could understand, we still don't understand what they were trying to do, if we could get there, we would, uh, there would be all kinds of implications, including not least peace on earth. You know, the idea of multiple vantage points, the refusal to be limited to a single vantage point and so forth. Um, uh, anyway, uh, and uh, one of the things that's funny about, uh, at that particular point, Hockney was working on his uh, photo collages. You know, you might have seen the Polaroid collages. And, and, uh, and he, that was far from being a love of photography, that was a critique of photography. He said that ordinarily a snapshot is perfectly fine if you don't mind looking at the world from the point of view of a paralyzed cyclops for a split <laughs> second. But that's not what the world is like. And that you need multiple vantages. And he was trying to, to do a critique. Now, Irwin solved this problem far more radically. He would never let his work be photographed. Back when I was Pro profiling Irwin in 1975, and I suspect most, or, uh, you probably have a few art people here, would say that Irwin is one of the 10 most important artists in America and has been for half a century at this point. Uh, he's 88 years old now. Uh, but he's the one you've never heard of or you've never seen because he will never let his work be photographed, and most of it of the last 40 years lasts two or three weeks and then gets taken down. Uh, but he's been incredibly imp in important as a thinker and so forth. But that's how he deals with photography. What, what Hockney says is that, uh, 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 well, well, let's put it, let me put it this way. I'll compare Hockney. What's really funny is he, Hockney asked me, do, you want, do I want to do the text for his book, the book about uh, the photo collages, which I did. You may have seen that big square book with a guy swimming on the cover and lots of images. And that text, which I wrote, was absolutely a refutation of Irwin, as far as Hockney was concerned. And Irwin read it and said, what a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> and then I did Irwin's catalog for his show at Mount Mocha, which was absolutely a refutation of Hockney. And Hockney called me and said, that's not true. And the two of them have been doing this for 35 years now. <laughs> and they've never met each other. But to give you a very quick view of what Irwin is saying, for example, Irwin says that the history of art over the last 500 years is the history of the subject of art. And it starts with Christ, with God, that's what you could do, basically. And then eventually you're allowed to do the king or you're allowed to do the burger who commissioned the painting. And eventually, you know, you get his wife and a few other people or you could get Mary and you get all that. Eventually, the time goes on and you're allowed to do the, uh, the housemaid, Chardin, for example, with her shawl. And then you're able to do the shawl and then eventually, and, and, and there's a complete collapse, uh, that there's a shrinking of, of the subject matter. There's a lowering, of, uh, it used to be exalted, and more and more it's becoming the ordinary world is acceptable and so forth. And then by the time you get to uh, cubism, you have what is universally lauded as the marriage of figure and ground. In other words, you get to the point where you're just doing that shawl, and now you're just doing, uh, by the way, you're going through impressionism, expressionism, all these kinds of things, and now you've collapsed to the point where everything is imbricated inside each other, you have multiple advantages all on one thing, and so forth. But then he says that the problem that arises is you can't very well have a painting, a cubist painting on the wall, and not pay attention to the shadow that it's casting. 
because the painting becomes the figure to the ground of the wall. And for Irwin, he says, that's a big problem. And, and so at first he starts doing paintings that include their shadows, and then it gets more and more. And eventually he says, well, you can't even do that. You have to just, you can't have anything on the wall. And what you're doing is you're playing with light to get kind of strange effects that people don't understand, but they can feel something strange is going on. And then eventually you can't do it at a gallery because that's just the figure to the ground <laughs> and so forth. And, and he basically is out in the world at that point. Uh, he ends up coming out the, from point zero, he comes out the far side and he does the garden at the Getty. If you've ever been to the Getty, that big garden in the middle of the Getty is by Robert Irwin. Anyway, that's his view. Hockney, by contrast, says that the great crisis for art happens in 1839. Or a phrase different, what he actually says, if you look at it, is he says that there's an incredible moment that happens uh, in 1425, which is that suddenly artists begin using lenses and mirrors. And you can go from a moment, if you, look, if, you, if you do what he did, which is he puts all the paintings, he has a Xerox machine in his studio. His studio is the size of a tennis court. Uh, because it was built over a tennis court, so it's as long as a tennis court and so forth. <laughs> and he has a wall, and he has a Xerox machine, he has this great art library that he's collected, and he starts Xeroxing all the paintings of the Western tradition, and he puts the Northern European ones on the top and the Southern European on the bottom, and it's 1350 to 1750, and there's just these paintings and these paintings and so forth, and then something suddenly happens from one day to the next in 1425, and it happens right there, parenthetically in Northern Europe, not Southern Europe, it happens in, in Bruges, and it's as if Europe has put on glasses. You go from awkward, you know, work this, to suddenly it is exactly almost, we would say, photorealist. And it's because, in fact, they have put on glasses. They are beginning to use lenses and curved mirrors and sort of things. And oddly enough, the first painting we see this, it is the, is the Arnolfini wedding, you know, the, the, the and, uh, and, uh, if you, the thing that's interesting there is that Arnolfini is the representative of the Medici Bank from Florence uh, in, 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 in Bruges. And he goes back on vacation and says, you won't believe what they're doing out in Bruges. And, and they're basically using curved mirrors, says Hock this is Hockney's theory. But, but the point is that from that moment forward, whether or not artists are using uh, lenses uh, or curved mirrors, the criteria for what constitutes a good painting is this kind of optical look. It's this frozen, you know, so, so, and that lasts from 1435 to 1839. What happens in 1839? Two things happen, actually very interesting things. One is that chemical photography is discovered. Uh, another is that Vermeer is discovered. Vermeer, who had uh, for all the years from 1600 to 1839, people thought he was a lousy artist because he had things out of focus and in focus. And suddenly he's doing exactly the same things that the Gary types are doing. And people are saying, wow, this is really cool. He was way ahead of all this, you know. But, but, uh, but anyway, just to finish quickly on that, I, 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 I'm going too, far, too long. But anyway, the point is, just, just very quickly, the point is that at that point, as far as hockey is concerned, uh, photography says, you don't have to, you, it's hopeless, you, you can't do this anymore because we can do it better than you. At that point, you begin to have impressionism, expressionism, all these ways of figuring out uh, ways that the things that, that art can do, that the mind actually does, that the photographic doesn't do. And in that sense, it stands in some, in some way. Anyway, okay, uh, you, I'm going to skip a bit because it's gone on too long. But uh, it brings me back, though, to... Uh, to uh, think of Irwin's. I was just going to very, say very quickly that, that Hockney gets extremely excited looking at physics. He loves talking to David Bohm, the great physicist who wrote Wholeness and uh, the Implicate Order. Uh, and, and this is, uh, and basically, he's talking about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and so forth. There are ways in which science itself, Cartesian science, uh, that starts with Descartes on the far side ends up, uh, to quote, uh, to quote uh, David Bohm, um, the notion that the one who thinks the ego is in principle completely separate from the, and independent of the reality he thinks about is of course firmly embedded in our Cartesian tradition. But general experience along with a great deal of recent scientific knowledge suggests that such a division cannot be maintained consistently. Uh, 
And at that point, uh, Hockney says, you can see why I was so excited. The insistence on the need to break down borders, to entertain the interconnectedness of things and of ourselves with things. The notion that in science today, it is no longer possible to have ideas about reality without taking our consciousness into account. And beyond that, uh, just the language that um, shares with other physicians. reason because there is no logic that can take you out there. You're stumbling around in the dark, but they keep bumping into each other. And this creates the possibility, people who are doing pure inquiry, in which the only thing that's pushing them forward is curiosity, you know, have a lot to say to each other. And, 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 uh, and uh, the wilderness that he talks about is stalked by explorers without maps and without any particular goals, and their principal compass is their reason and, their anima and the thing that animates them is their curiosity. Okay, now to wrap things up. Freeman Dyson, writing in the New York Review of Books the other day, argued that the public has a distorted view of science because children are taught in school falsely that science is a collection of firmly established truths. In fact, science is not a collection of truths. It's a continuing exploration of mysteries. Coming from the other side, James Baldwin once wrote, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been occluded by the answers. In closing, I want to close with two poems. Uh, I began with two poems, I'm going to close with two. I'd like to evoke the la uh, thoughts from, first of all, uh, Ian Fraser my old colleague at the New Yorker, Sandy Fraser, who, and this will, this will, this, you're gonna like this, this particular passage. It's not a poem, but it's a, it reads like one. Uh, Sandy Fraser can write about anything, and he's the best writer in America. Uh, uh, and in this case, he was writing about bears. He used to keep a file of bear human encounters, little clippings, and one day he took it out, and he wrote this gorgeous piece about bear human en uh, encounters. And it ends with this passage. It's possible to walk for a long time through the woods and not see much of anything. Beautiful scenery makes its point quickly, then you have to pay attention or it starts to slide by like a looped background in a Saturday morning cartoon. A pine cone falls from one limb to another, a rock clatters down a canyon, and your own thoughts talk on inside your head. People sometimes say that what is great about bears, and especially grizzlies, is the large tracts of wilderness that they imply. That a good bear population implies a healthy, unspoiled habitat. But bears don't simply imply wilderness. Bears are wilderness. Bears are what all the trees and rocks and meadows and mountains and drainages must add up to. When you see a bear, the spot where you see it becomes instantly different from every other place you've ever seen. Bears make you pay attention. They keep the mountains from turning to a blur and they stop yourself from bullying you like nothing else in nature. A woods with a bear in it is real to a man walking through it in a way that a woods with no bear in it is not. <laughs> Roscoe Black God, how I love that name, Roscoe Black. Um, a man who survived a grizzly attack in Glacier Park several years ago described the moment when the bear had him on the ground. He laid on me for a few seconds, not doing anything. I could feel his heart beating against my heart. The idea of that heart beating someplace just the other side of ours is what makes people read about bears and tell stories about bears and argue about bears and theorize about bears and dream about bears. Bears are one of the places in the world where the big mysteries run close to the surface. So I think I actually will end with one last poem. In this case, it's Thomas Hanstromer. And when I first gave this lecture, uh, 
he, I always said, this is the guy. It's just totally unfair. He hasn't won the Nobel Prize yet. And the only reason is because he's Swedish and the Swedes won't give the Nobel Prize to one of their own. And then they did. <laughs> and he is an absolutely astonishing poet. Uh, he is by day a, he, he died recently, but he was by day a social worker, working with children's uh, uh, therapy, uh, teenagers and so forth. But in this particular poem, which I wanted to, to close with, uh, is called Century Duty. And he's remembering the days, apparently, and one of the things that they did in, in Sweden, I don't know what they still do, is that they had universal uh, 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 service, that every, every Swede had to be in the military or some other thing for one year. Um, and so he's in the military, and he's sent out, I mean, I don't know what they're guarding against, an invasion from Norway or something, but. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, he's way up north, and he's sent out to this uh, cops in the forest, far from where everybody is back at the thing, and he's doing sentry duty, he's doing night duty. I'm ordered out to a big hump of stones as if I were an aristocratic corpse from the Iron Age. The rest are still back in the tent, sleeping, stretched out like spokes in a wheel. In the tent, the stove is boss. It's a big snake that swallows a ball of fire, and it hisses. But it's silent out here in the spring night among chill stones waiting for the dawn. Out here in the cold, I start to fly like a shaman straight back to her body. Some places pale from her swimming suit. The sun shone right on us. The moss was hot. I rush along the side of warm moments, but I can't stay that long. I'm whistled back through space. I crawl among the stones back to here and now. <coughs> Task to be where I am. Even in this solemn and absurd role, I'm still the place where creation does a little work on itself. Task to be where I am. Even in this solemn and absurd role, I'm still the place where creation does a little work on itself. Dawn comes, uh, the sparse tree trunks, Take on color now, the frostbitten forest flowers form a silent search party after something that has disappeared into the dark. But to be where I am and to wait. I am full of anxiety, obstinate, confused. Things not yet happened are already here. I feel that they're just out there. A murmuring mass just outside the barrier. They can only slip in one by one. They want to slip in, why? They do, one by one. I am the turnstile. To be the turnstile and to wait, to be the place where creation gets to do a little work on itself, one could hardly do better by way of characterizing the scientist's lot and the artist's. Only attend. Thank you. So I, I should take some questions, I guess, if, that's, if there are any questions. Uh, come on, don't be shy. Well, OK, there's one. Go ahead. Uh, but loud. Heard, Stand up and, and yell so people uh, can hear you. You used uh, a word, I think, twice, uh, imbricate. Imbricate, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, I wasn't quite sure. That's hard. That yeah. a What's the scientific meaning? That's interesting. Uh, if you look at a uh, bar or a river, right. it's composed of flattened stones. Right. And the manner in which the stones arrange themselves uh, according to the current, uh, so they are least likely to be moved by the current by a certain force, is called imbrication. That's what I mean. No, yeah, no, <laughs> no, I mean, in other words, that they're, the, the thing that, and, and, and in some ways, in terms of art, and in terms of science, it's a very similar thing, that, that over time, things lock into that, mm -hmm. that place, and they are imbricated, they are leaning against each other in a way that is completely necessary, and yet at the same time, completely haphazard. It just happened, but, but it, ha it locks into what afterwards feels like it was always there and was always necessary. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. You can you live with that? Okay. Yeah. What do you feel is the philosophical conclusion that Hockney comes through 
after he uh, deconstructs Vermeer's method? Does that lead him to some philosophical? He he, dis he he goes even further. He, he goes further back. He deconstructs Van Eyck. Uh, it's really, I mean, it's fat. Vermeer is 200 years into this. And this just drove, by the way, it was incredibly controversial. Uh, this is a bird talking back to the ornithologists in our history. No, 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 you don't understand. You're an artist. You don't have any say here. And, and uh, but he, he did, uh, it's uh, incredibly, he has a wonderful book called Secret Knowledge uh, where he talks about this. What, Hockney, one of the things I love about Hockney, he's one of the great noticers. He notices things. So, so, uh, for example, if you, if you had it in your mind, the, the Arnolfini wedding, remember it's the pregnant uh, woman and the man, and, she's, uh, and he's holding her, and in the, in the background there is a uh, cod vex mirror, which shows, if you look at it, the people who come to see him, see the couple, i.e. the artist himself and so forth. Um, and there was this, uh, I published the first section of when I published the thing, the first section went back as far as Caravaggio. He was convinced that Caravaggio was doing things. And a physicist called me, actually, and said, I need to talk to Hockney. And at that, by that time, Hockney put up his whole wall. And Hockney was walking along the wall, and he was saying, and the physicist was saying, I'm looking for a particular picture here. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'll know it when I see it. And he said, yeah, this picture right here. We can use this picture right here. And it was a Lotto, by the, Lotto, the artist Lotto. And there was a... Uh, uh, a rug, a, a tablecloth, a, a Persian rug with a couple behind, and the, if you looked at the rug, it went in and out of focus. It was completely in focus, then it went out of focus, then it, then it seemed to slide a little bit, it was completely in focus, then it went out of focus, and he said, if we use, and, and he began, the, this, he, this guy Falco was a quantum a person who was doing quantum optics. He's the kind of guy who puts together atoms to spell out IBM, you know, and, and has one of the most expensive uh, uh, labs in the world. And, and, uh, but but he, he, so he knows from optics. Uh, and, and he's looking at this, he said, well, if you, look at, if you assume that the uh, distance between the eyes and the people is this, and then you do this, and you, and you see how far this had to go back, then you can see that he's obviously working with a lens that is of such and such depth, that has a field of de depth this side, and he kept on re refocusing it. And, and, you can, and if we're right, then this thing is going to be off by this amount, and he said, and he said it was off by that amount. And he said, that in size is what we call a proof. He said, you have a hypothesis, and then you test it, and it's proof. And so this is no longer to be argued with, said Falco. You know. But then Hockney said, but yeah, but what I can't figure out, we know that lenses exist at this point, but look, all the way over here, there's, they, it seems to happen here. And this is a great moment about scientists and, 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 uh, uh, and humanists. The scientist says, yeah, of course, they're using, he's using a convex mirror, a concave mirror. And Hockney says, what? He says, well, if you take your shaving mirror, you can do this tomorrow morning, if, uh, if you take one of those concave makeup mirrors and so forth, and it's light outside but it's dark inside the bathroom, and you hold it up, you can move it around to the point where you get an absolutely crystal clear, perfect image upside down of what's going on outside. And you'll see the car go by and so forth, and you can draw that, and if you want to get detail that's further back, you can readjust the mirror and so forth. And he says, well, but were there concave mirrors? And he says, well, look at that thing in the picture. <laughs> and sure enough, in all those pictures, there's convex mirrors, which if you, you just turn them around, they're concave mirrors. And, and uh, then there's a different thing going on in Florence slightly, but, but in any case, so we, we did a whole thing at, the, at my institute where we had philosophers, we had Walheim, we had, uh, uh, we had scientists, we had all kinds of people talking. I think what Hockney would, I mean, Hockney isn't, uh, full of himself, and he doesn't you know, claim to be the greatest art historian or the greatest philosopher and so forth, but what he is filled with is the excitement, in this case, that artists are thinking things through. And, th and that, that part of the history of art is, the, is one of the ways you can watch, in an almost scientific way, the growing expansion of, in this case, wider horizons and things like that. And his argument, by the way, is that wider horizons are needed now. Um, and when he says that, that we need to think of, when we look at Syria, we need to think like Cubists. 
of all the different angles that things are happening from and so forth, and, and that there isn't a, an absolute truth, and that, that things are moving all the time and so forth. You have to look really fast if you're going to see the world is fast disappearing and so forth. And, there, and, and uh, you know, famously, uh, Bernofsky, when he did The Ascent of Man, which you might remember that TV show, he had this amazing moment where he was talking about Heisenberg. For those of you, you know, Heisenberg basically says that, that you can't both uh, get the velocity of a subatomic particle and where it is. You can get where it is or you can get the velocity. And, when you, and the minute you define one or the other, it's based on who, what the observer is asking. That, and that, so the observer is brought into it and, and so forth. You know. And, and uh, Bronofsky, the famous guy who helped to build the atom bomb, is giving this whole thing. He goes to Auschwitz. And he has this amazing scene where he is picking up the soil from Auschwitz and he's holding it in his hand. He says, understand that Heisenberg then gets put in charge of the atomic program for the Nazis. But he says, I've always liked to think, and I think Heisenberg too thought, that his was the principle of tolerance. That you had to have tolerance for multiple viewpoints or that you had to have tolerance, that you couldn't, that you had to have two things, you know, and, and similarly that, that whether a light was a wave or a, a, a particle and so forth, that, 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 that these were things that you had to have tolerance for multiplicity, for contradictory things, and, and I think both Hockney and Irwin, and finally the great scientist, Freeman Dyson, would, would all agree with that. Yeah. When you were convening the conversations with scientists and humanists, Right. Did the scientists tend to say something about their encounters with the humanists or vice versa, or did they say the same thing? Um, they were always different, by the way, and there were some, I mean, for example, uh, what you need to know about, uh, about Tom Eisner is that he studied with Bush in Uruguay, and in, uh, you know, the great conductor Bush, uh, Wilhelm Bush, Bush, I believe, right, uh, was in exile uh, in Uruguay, and he studied piano with him. And he was a great, great pianist, in addition to being well, a, an event I never did, but by the way, I wish somebody would, and you should do it, <laughs> would be an event called, What the Fuck is Going On with Scientists and Music? <laughs> I mean, there's so many scientists who are superb pianists or violinists or so forth and, and what, what is happening with that when that happens you know and so forth um, generally speaking uh, the uh, you get an in, in, interesting situation uh, and in fact that's the subject of the book that, that they have selling, selling over there which is uh, this book this recent book of mine is called uh, Waves Passing of the Night Walter Birch in the Land of the Astrophysicists now, Walter Birch, you may know as, if you're into, are anybody in, anybody in film studies here? Walter Birch is a god. He, he is the greatest film and sound editor in the United States and probably in the world. He did the Godfather movies, Apocalypse Now, The English Patient, Particle Fever. He's, he's this incredible, among, he did a fantastic book, by the way. Write this down, uh, called In the Blink of an Eye, which is 95 pages long. It's, supposedly about film and sound editing. It is about how to live. It's said in the art of, you know. By the way, uh, uh, Yoda in, in Star Wars is based on Walter Birch. Uh, you know, just somebody who's just totally set, you know, got it figured out. Uh, Walter Birch, in his spare time, does all kinds of things. And one of the things he's been doing for the last 20 years is astrophysics. He's been working on a theory of gravitational astrophysics. So what he isn't working on, the English patient, he was off working out this thing of, of, about Kepler uh, and going back, to, uh, it's, a, it's a, a kind of wiggy theory based on a long discredited theory from the 18th century, uh, but he, uh, it had been discredited for various reasons. It's so discredited that it has cooties. That when you, that, uh, it, was a, it was a theory about where, uh, actually it's a funny story, it, it, it'll come back to your question in just a second. <laughs> It's a funny story. So, so what happens is that there's this guy in the old days, uh, translators. And as for example, this guy named Johann Dietz, who was, uh, had a PhD so he could be Titius, you could Latinize your name. 
Copernic became Copernicus. That meant he was a doc, he had a doctorate. And Titius, uh, like many translators, in the middle of the translation, without in any way indicating he was changing voices, just said, this reminds me of this thing I was thinking about the other day. And you'd be reading, in this case, Charles Bonnet, who was one of the great natural historians, uh, natural uh, philosophers. And he's translating the work, and he says, this reminds me of this really weird thing I figured out the other day. And, and, and he says, if you take the number 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and you uh, add 4, and you divide by 3, uh, or you add four, you subtract by three, and subtract three, and divide by 10, whatever it was, some weird, really weird, completely arbitrary thing, you get up, you got this series of numbers, and the numbers is 0 0.4, 0 0.7, 1, uh, 1.6, 2.2, whatever it is, and he says, and if you look, that's really weird, because that is the spacing of the planets from the sun. Mm -hmm. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, he says, something is missing, and if I were you astronomers, I would go look at here, <laughs> and then you get Jupiter, Saturn. And sure enough, the asteroid belt gets discovered exactly where it's supposed to be, and Uranus gets discovered exactly where it's supposed to be, and meanwhile this guy named Bode comes along, he was kind of like the Neil deGrasse Tyson of his time, and he turns it into a formula, and it cleans it up a little bit, and, and, and when Uranus is discovered, they said, That's, we have a law. It's, we're descriptive, we're predictive, and Gauss, the great, great mathematician, says, no, 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 no. Nature does not have these f formulas with ones and fours and threes and tens. I mean, that's just not how nature works. You know, that's too, too ugly. And secondly, seven instances, eight instances, that's not enough instances. And thirdly, what the hell is going on? And by the way, there's something really weird with that zero to one thing and so forth. And uh, Walter, typically, after a busy day of editing, and more to the point after a busy day of having to deal with the contingencies of Hollywood, where you'd work for three months on a scene and suddenly it was thrown out because of some completely arbitrary reason. And so, but he would go home and he'd do astrophysics. And he would read science and he read this thing one day and he said, well, that's weird. I mean, uh, you know, it seems like it might work. But what happened historically is that Neptune was discovered at the wrong place. At which point it was thrown out completely. And it became, are there any astrophysicists in the room? If you take Astronomy 101, it, it, the only use of Titius Bode today is to hold it up and say, do not do this. <laughs> wrong, 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 you know, and they beat it. And this is numerology. It has cooties. It has cooties to such an extent that if you try to send a, a, a scientific paper with the words Titius Bode in it, for 75 years it wouldn't even be looked at. You know? Notwithstanding the fact that Pluto was discovered, it was exactly where it was supposed to be. You know? And so he basically very quickly just says, he said, well, I can see why the formula is so wiggy. It's, it's because you have Earth as one. If you instead make Mercury one, you, the way to do that is you divide the whole thing by, well, it's 0.4, so you divide it by four, uh, you know, by four fifths, or four tenths, and, and, and you do this, and this, and this, and this, and this. It turns out to be a really pretty formula, one of those kinds that we like. One plus two to the nth power times three, you know. And actually, uh, he says, what it really is is 1 plus 2 to the nth, and, he, and he's going on like this, and he, and, and he says, and why don't we look at all the things we know that orbit things? Like, it turns out there's 37 objects in the solar system that are moons that go around uh, planets, and that there's uh, so forth, and it turns out that 80 to 85% of them follow the law. And the ones that don't, like Neptune, turn out to be exactly halfway between the two places they're supposed to be. It gets exciting, and, and as an example of a, a humanist talking to an astrophysicist, he says, I know that formula. I've seen that formula. I am an acoustician. That is the formula for the octave. And then if you think about it, what seems to be going on is that uh, there seems to be an undulation of wave patterns uh, such that things will not gather where there's high frequencies, and they will gather where there's low frequencies. Uh, they will tend to, over time, do that. And, 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 uh, and they will do it following patterns. And then he says, if you think about uh, sound, if you think about keys, you know, a, you get 440 megahertz, 880, 110, and so forth. And, and you'll see that uh, the Earth falls into A flat. This is, he, he lays it all out. He can play for you what the whole thing sounds like and so forth. Uh, when that recent uh, 
uh, planet was just discovered uh, as the solar system, Trappist-1. Uh, it turns out it is perfect, fits into it. You can hear, listen to the music of that one. It's, again, this is, no, this is notional mu music. He is saying all the way, he begins by saying, this may just be apophenia. Jennifer, for anybody who knows what apophenia is. Repetition of patterns that aren't there. Damn! <laughs> he gets invited to dinner. Who, who was that? Well, it's not exactly, but it is the human tendency to see patterns where there are no patterns. And he says, maybe this is it. But at least look at these numbers. So the point of this, part one is a profile of Birch and, and, this, and being obsessed. Part two, at the end of part one, he says, uh, you know, it, it's certainly worth entertaining. There seems to be something going on here. And part two begins, astrophysicists were not in an entertaining mood. And it's me trying to find a single astrophysicist who will talk to him. And what the astrophysicists always say, well, have him write a peer-reviewed paper. You know? And he is the first to say, I can't write a peer-reviewed paper. There are some pretty amazing implications of what he's talking about, uh, but they won't even look at it, or they just dismiss it. And, and at one point, one of them says to, uh, to me, who's kind of cynical about things, he says, you have to understand what, a, uh, what the education of astrophysicists is. It's basically two things. You have to learn over a period of five grueling years how to write a peer-reviewed paper and how not to look at anything that's not a peer-reviewed paper. <laughs> And if you've done that, then you've become an astrophysicist, you know. And so the, the, this becomes a comedy of the sociology of, of whether humanists and, and, and scientists can talk to each other. Because what's absolutely needed, and Birch is the first to admit is I need some graduate student who just wants to look at this with me and play with me. And we can do some really interesting research and, and get some statistical analysis and so forth. I can't do that, you know. And, and, but no graduate student in their right mind would go near this because uh, they will not have a job. See, they can write their whole PhD dissertation and prove that he's right, but nobody will hire them because they're not doing super string theory. Which, by the way, is every bit as weird as this. Super string theory, by definition, cannot be falsified. It cannot be proven. And yet, that's how you get tenure. <laughs> You know, it, it's, 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 so it becomes really interesting, that whole thing. So that's what this book is about, kind of all this stuff, but also of talking kids. Yes. Sorry, well, this, uh, I guess the rest of this is... Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> Am I being terrible? <laughs> that's, what, that's funny that you say that. My grandmother, who was a, a German uh, emigre in California, used to talk to me years later and say, Einstein, for years, his, the rest of his life after Hiroshima, he had heartburn over it. <laughs> so, I just want to say to my astrophysicist colleagues here, I mean, it is well known that the ranging of Hamilton mechanics can explain pretty much all of the mechanics. Except that uh, Walter points out things that it doesn't explain that are quite interesting. I mean, that, that they will say that, that it, there's a whole set of things about how, how they generate and they form this way because over time gravitation. but. Uh, for example, uh, three of the planets that uh, of the moons that surround Jupiter do do orbital resonance, but one doesn't. Yeah, but I mean, I guess I guess it goes back to at least uh, on the classical level, right. it has to avoid energy So I mean, on the quantum level, which was you know to again challenge another point of you know, I don't think cubism was the most important thing in the 20th century. I think the dawn of quantum mechanics was. Because right. I think that really changed how we view not just the natural world, but also a lot of these predictive models. Originally, as you mentioned, you know, we thought that using just position and momentum would be able to predict everything, right. hence Lagrangian. But it actually turned out to be that on at least some level, quantum mechanics was a much better description which is why as the most studied theory, you know, it has such robustness. Right. Now, I do like your... By the way, Leonard Schlein, who I quote, <laughs> exactly the same way that Giotto is doing conic, conic sections before Kepler, but the cubists are basically doing issues that are similar to the issues that quantum mechanics are going to be dealing with 10 years before the quantum mechanics is being developed, and, and, and talking in, in, within their own terms in similar sorts of ways. But, okay, I'm sorry. What I, what I do like, though, is this idea of the intersection of imagination and uh, critical thinking. I 
think that's an interesting point because, as you mentioned, supersymmetry and other string theories, which are more mathematically and philosophically based, haven't had any experimental tests. But I would say that we are approaching ways of testing that, and one of those was the gravitational wave experiment that was just happened. So a lot of times, mathematical physics is a way a lot of, you know, in addition to proving this and that, they try to find experiments, and they actually, in the papers, last, you know, couple paragraphs will say, here's a way we think you can test it. And experimentalists like me look at that and say, this is a bunch of bullshit, but maybe they're right eventually. And I think that's important, and that's, that's the way, for instance, we intersect, you know, between theories and experimentalists in my field. So, the, a, a thing that I would, counter with. And by the way, I'm more emphatic in what I just said than Walter is. Walter is completely level-headed all the time. He says, you know, but what about this? And then and, and he goes forward and so forth. But, but uh, Walter is as much of an acoustician. One thing that surprises me in my trying to find answers, you know, for God's sake, this is Walter Birch. You know, you don't want to spend a day or two with Walter Birch. I mean, he's, you know, <laughs> He is as much of, when you go to see a movie and it says Dolby 5.1, Walter Birch invented Dolby 5.1, you know. Uh, he understands how music waves work. And he sees, he is noticing something in these patterns that, uh, that are, it's a different metaphor. And that's one of the, uh, in the language of uh, different ways of seeing, you know, different perspectives and so forth. He is offering that you might find things that are interesting if you look at it metaphorically this way. One of the things, by the way, that, that and this is where you'll probably get annoyed, but, but uh, he talks about the two different kinds of waves. Uh, there's propagating waves, which are like the ones that were just discovered. There's a, uh, uh, two black holes collide with each other, you know, millions and millions and billions of years ago, and the wave that they send out takes that long to get here. And if you have the equipment to hear it, you can pick it up, and that's it's a kind of gravitational wave that's incredibly, 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 almost imperceptibly faint by the time it gets here. But they astonishingly, like you say, just a few uh, a year ago, basically, were able to, to, to locate it. Uh, but a standing wave, which is the other kind, of, and a propagating wave, let's say, is like a wave that starts in Japan and ends breaking in San Francisco. And what happens with that kind of wave is that the water basically stays in place. It goes up and down, but the wave goes through the water. The other kind of wave, which is the wave that, if you're an acoustician, is your big problem, is a standing wave. And that's what you see here with trout streams and so forth, where you see a boulder and you see water racing down. And uh, there's a little area of flatness. And then there's suddenly the water is bunching up, and it bunches into these waves moving away from it. Uh, and in those cases, it's the water that's rushing through and the wave that stays in place. And that's a problem when you have, when you're inventing Dolby 5.1, because you have dead spots in the, in the auditorium that are caused by these waves that are, are standing. They aren't moving through the whole thing. They're just standing, the, and you get that. And he's saying, this looks to me, as an acoustician, much more like a standing wave. Uh, and then you say, which, you know, th and then you say to so well, what's it standing in? You know, uh, you know, what's, and, and he says, you know, I'm so far out of my league here, I don't know, but it seems to me that it, you know, it could be dark matter, it could be dark, and then the scientists come back and say, yeah, but dark matter is way, way too faint to, he'd say that, oh, but then he says over billions of years, you might have a pattern develop where you have these kinds of troughs and, and peaks, uh, and, and, and this might, in fact, if you try, talk to scientists about trying to find uh, dark matter, it's incredibly difficult to find. They're incredibly expensive experiments. They haven't found it yet. He says, but maybe the solar system itself is a place looked at and understood in an interesting way. And he just says, I don't know if this is true. And then at the end of it, by the way, he says, and, and, and the thing that drives people crazy, he says, you know, at a certain point, I don't care if it's true. It's something, this has been an incredible journey for me. Uh, a way of finding peace, and, and I've found out all these wonderful, wonderful things along the way. By the way, it occurs to me one thing I should read. <laughs> Is that, you probably think that's completely wacko. Uh, the other ones did. 
But here's just a great thing about somebody who is a great scientist and a great artist, Kepler, who was a great reader, but one last, a, great, a great writer. One last thing, to, uh, this is a beautiful thing to end it on. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, I may not be able to find it, but there's a quote of Kepler's where he basically says, uh, my, my wife presented me with a salad this afternoon. And I said, it is as if through all eternity, tomatoes and lettuce and, and oil and so forth had been rotating and had finally come together in, in a salad. <laughs> and my lovely said to me, but not as perfectly as this one by me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.